greet you all in the very blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Welcome to our yearly family seminar. As we know, the seminar title for this year is about the marriage specifically, not just about, well, what we've been using in the last um, a few years about bringing up godly seed. So this focus on what makes a happy marriage is the theme for our family seminar this year. This will run until, the first session will run until 10.30, right? Then from there, we'll continue after a 15 minutes break till 12 o'clock, right? So till 10.30 is the first part of this session. Before we go further, now let us turn our Bibles to Genesis. Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. Right, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Now let us read from verses 18 to 24. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 24, reading. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground... The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowls of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was no found, not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And uh, yeah, that is all. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us first turn to God in prayer. Let us all pray. Eternal God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another year to study your word regarding the family and your church, to build up strong families, to have families that would truly reflect the glory of God and bring up godly seed for your kingdom. And Lord, we do plead once again for the fresh cleansing and washing in the blood of our Saviour. As far as it is, is from the West. Remove thou our sins from us and draw us unto thyself. And we plead also again that your Holy Spirit would work in every heart to embrace your truth and to live by them. For, Lord, we know that the words of men, the preparations of men, avail nothing unless your Holy Spirit work. And just one word from him, Lord, would transform us. Lord, we pray for ourselves. Lord, we desire to be obedient to your word. So speak to us, O God. Speak to every family, every single, every elderly, that... Lord, your church will have families that are truly what they are supposed to be. We ask and pray this not for ourselves. We ask and pray this for the kingdom that is yours on earth. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we have the picture of God officiating the, the first marriage in the world. Now, what makes a happy marriage? What makes a happy marriage? First and foremost, I want to cover why we are studying this topic. Now, families make up the church. Singles as well. But when we talk about the family, it is an important backbone because from two persons will spawn more. God did institute marriage. I'm not saying that singles are not important. Right? God also will use the singles in the church. But this is a family seminar. 
And singles must also learn. Maybe God may want you to get married one day. You do not know. And if God intends for you to be single, I want to emphasize this important point. Even if God wants you to be single, this is still a topic in the Bible. Every topic in the Bible is relevant to everybody. It's just like studying anything else in the Bible. So singles must not think, if I'm not getting married, if I'm called to singlehood, then I'm not interested. Everything in God's Word has its purpose and its usefulness. God can use you to help someone who intends to get married who is in, or who, who, are, who is married or your own relatives. So the next point about why we study this topic is because, well, from families spawn seed. And unless the marriage is strong, it is very difficult to have godly seed. So we must understand what makes a strong family. Now, some married couples had little or no prior premarital counseling before marriage. Then this session is important for you to have a glimpse. This is by no means um, a, a married premarital counseling session, all right? That's far more in-depth. But I hope this gives you some foundation. And last, and not least, and last but not least, those who have gone through premarital counseling. Well, this is an important reminder, a reminder to ask ourselves, now, is my marriage what it's supposed to be? Why is my marriage not as happy as I thought it should be? A reminder. How are we going to go about this session? First, I'll go about defining now a happy marriage because the seminar is about a happy marriage. What is a happy marriage? What makes a happy marriage? Then from there, I'll cover how to build a happy marriage, right? the building of a happy marriage. Then in closing, maintaining a happy marriage. All right? So what is it? How to build it? If you're in the midst of marriage, well, how to uh, make sure that building is maintained, is truly well run, is happy in the eyes of the Lord. All right? So this is how we'll go forward. So let's begin to ask now, how is your marriage? Really, how is your marriage? Some pictures here to depict a picture speaks more than a thousand words, all right? People say, first, first of all, well, when you after you're married, is it just pretty much growing apart? People just at home, just going about their own things, doing their own things, right? Having your own life, always on some device. Even when you're together at the, at the table, is it a happy marriage? How is your marriage? And when children comes, how is it like? Is that a picture of how things are at home? Face always upset, always stressed, right? And look at the poor children. I don't know whether you can see, but look at their eyes. The little girl looks so frightened. The little boy looks so sad, right? Between the couple. Is it a happy marriage? They say, I do not know what happened to our marriage. We used to be so close before children, and now it is just, just like a war zone every day. Is that a happy marriage? How is your marriage? And for those of you who are uh, more senior in age, well, is it like that? You know, always having arguments, unhappiness, disagreements, frustrated with one another, is that marriage? Is marriage supposed to be like that? Is it really sweeter as the years go by? And for the ones in the middle, will you end up like this elderly couple there? Will it be like that? How do I prevent that? How do I maintain my marriage to ensure that it will be a happy marriage? Now, conflict brews after people get married. Struggle to have own needs met. Maybe that will, you can relate to that in your heart. It's just like everything is about the home, the marriage. What about my needs? Then you begin to grow this illusion. I thought marriage was supposed to be a happy thing. Maybe children at home, you look at your parents and you say, you know, if marriage is like that, I don't think I want to get married. It's it's not what it's supposed to be. I thought marriage was supposed to be happy. 
seems to be a delusionment to even to the singles. And then there is the avoidance of issues. Over time, it's just so bad, you just feel it's better not to talk about things, all right? Then you just go about your own way. Better not to talk. At least we have peace. Come to a point where you just feel that, uh, just, just avoid issues. Now, sometimes I wonder, why is it that some elderly couples or even middle-aged people, they begin to sleep in different rooms. They seem to have a different life, but they, well, they just live under one roof. That is all. Well, why? Because of resentment in the heart. They come to a point where they just feel that we can't even talk about things anymore. We just, we just live our own lives. The resentment is so strong. There is no desire even to work things out anymore. This is what our marriage is destined to be. That is all. This is how the world themselves also see marriage. Because it's the fact of life. Studies after studies show that while the beginning during courtship, well, that is the romantic stage. Then when they first get, got married, well, there is a period of a honeymoon stage. So sweet, all right? That's called honeymoon, right? So sweet. And then slowly, but very often, surely, and certainly surely, conflict begins. Toxic environment develops, all right? That's why it's like the sign of toxic danger. The conflict stage begins, and that seems to be the stage it stays with, stays with them, and it goes on and on. So, reality before marriage, love, romance. Early into marriage, well, it begins to fade a bit, but it's still nice. Then eventually heartbreak. Heartbreak, because marriage is unhappy. Does it reflect your own marriage? Are you afraid to get married because you see that is what happens to marriage? for believers as well. Now let's begin eh, to ask ourselves, now, what is a happy marriage? What is a happy marriage? Because we can have all have our own ideas, what is a happy marriage? We have to go back to scriptures. Unless you subscribe to scriptures and say, this is what a happy marriage is. You are going to struggle and you, are, you will never have a happy marriage. Never. Because you are trying to create your own kind of happiness. Anything that is your own is not going to work. It may be in the beginning nice, but eventually it will lead to heartbreak. So what is biblically supposed to be a happy marriage? That must be in your mind. This is a happy marriage. All right, then like I said, we then we will go to talking about the foundation of a happy marriage. Once you know this is a happy marriage, now then how do I build this happy marriage? Maybe my marriage is not happy. How do I build it to be one that is happy? According to the word of God, of course. Now after, after that, we have to then realize it, it doesn't stop that. We know it, there are conflicts, there are difficulties. It's the reality of life. Then we talk about, now, how to maintain this happy home, this happy marriage. How to maintain it according to the word of God. All right, so that is how we are going to um, tackle this issue about building a happy marriage. So let's begin. A happy marriage. What is it? What is in your mind about a happy marriage? Before you came or before you got married or when you want to get married, what is in your mind about a happy marriage. Now, what makes a happy marriage? Now, to some people, well, they say, you know, from the eyes of my friends, it's a happy marriage because others think and say that I have a good marriage. I have a good marriage. So it's just whatever, you, you live a life which, which you say, well, people think that I have a happy marriage and that's all that matters. My parents think so, my friends, my colleagues think so. Right? If I have married, is that what a happy what people think about your marriage? Or is it what God thinks about your marriage? There's a big difference. You can feel other people may say that your marriage is happy. Is it really a happy marriage? Ask yourself, is this what will make you happy? 
Is a happy marriage is, well, you know, always um, staring into one another's eye, um, going for walks in the park, going on holidays, see the background is, I don't know, autumn or cherry blossom, something like that. Just very nice life, very happy life together. Having nice dinners, just traveling, eating as a family or as a couple, right? This is a, look at this picture. It's the picture of my dream. Oh, when you are old, you know, you have everything that you need, um, a good retirement, um, enjoying life together, just gallivanting, traveling around the world. Is that your picture of a happy marriage? Is this what will make you happy and your marriage happy? Now we have to really ask ourselves, am I putting on a false front? We may outwardly appear happy, even to our church friends, but you know in your heart, as a husband, as a wife, things are not well. But outwardly, that is a happy marriage. And you think doing these things, well, they will make you happy? A false front. Now, some husband and wives think that this is what makes a happy marriage. These are the things that make a happy marriage. The world. The world, right? The things in the world, having them. So as a husband and wife, the, the lower part, husband and wife, thumb, thumbs up. Well, if we have the world. Now, this is typically the the concept of the world. Now, I'm spending some time here because I want to bring up in us to ask ourselves, deep down, sincerely, even as a Christian, am I actually like the world? In my mind, a happy marriage is we have the world. Well, you can come to church, we have church, we have all these things, but the reality is all these things are secondary. Having the world, living like the world, is what makes a happy marriage. And I hope I will get that today. Or the middle picture. No, pastor, it's not about the world. But as long as I am happy, this is a happy marriage. I say again, as long as I am happy, this is a happy marriage. It is about me. Look at the picture. Well, if everything is about the wife, well, this is a happy, the wife is, is a happy marriage. Or sometimes even the husband feels... Whatever my wife wants, as long as she has it, well, we are having a happy marriage or the other way around. This is a happy marriage. Basically about me, I, what I feel, what I think, what I want. Well, then you have this last idea of a happy marriage. We have the world and God. And I notice, notice I did not say God and the world. I have the world and also I have the semblance of a Christian life coming to church regularly do not fool ourselves we can be very much in church we can be even serving in church but the reality inside our heart the world is still very strong we want the world but to ease our conscience that well i should have a proper marriage we still serve god we still do things but in our heart well we are like white sepulchers right on the outside looking nice, but on the inside is just dead bones. Now this, people can feel, if I have that, even if it's that, this is a happy marriage. I have best of both worlds, that is a happy marriage. Just one side of the world, well, Christians should not be like that. Well, I have best of both worlds. Happy marriage means that. And I have been achieving that, pastor. All right? I can live like the world, enjoy the pleasures of the world, and still, well, have God, a semblance of that in my marriage. This is a perfect happy marriage. Now, what is a happy marriage? Now, so are this a happy marriage? My, my spouse makes me feel loved, makes me feel happy, often telling me and others how wonderful I am. Is that a happy marriage to you, husband, wife? I've said it many times, right? Uh, let's go on first. My spouse supports me by talking to me, spending a lot of time with me uh, when, whenever I want. Oh, that's so supportive. Now, I'm not saying that that is wrong, but we'll see um, what is the potential problem. My spouse goes, goes everywhere with me, always with me. They say, well, people look at this couple. They're always together. They're always doing things together. And for you, because a happy marriage means that, everywhere you go, you say, hey, husband, you better be with me. Or wife, you better be with me even when I'm serving God or anything, well, you, you must be with me. As long as we're together, holiday, to, everything is done together, then that is something that makes me happy. 
Now remember, I, I mentioned, or, or let me go on further. I'm happy I am married. As long as I'm married and I'm not alone. As long as I'm not alone, that's a happy life. That's a happy marriage. I'm not alone. That's all. I live my dreams. I have my dreams, my independence, my, my comfortable house. My, I can fulfill my aspirations. Well, and you know, my family looks wonderful. I have all these things on the outward. It is a happy marriage. Now, I'm not necessarily saying everything there is evil, but we will come to the danger of thinking that this is a happy marriage. We have nice things, nice time together. We get to do whatever we want, wherever we want. And the, my, our life is very smooth. So all these things makes a happy marriage. Now here is one key point. Now it is not that nice things and leisure are not supposed to be part of a marriage. I'm not saying that marriages must not have these things. It is wrong to have anything that is leisure, anything that is, that is um, nice. We are not saying that. But when these things, when these things are what we believe define a happy marriage. Now, that is when we fall into the delusion and become unhappy eventually. So, Christian, I just want to start off making it very clear. Let's be very honest in our hearts. What makes a happy marriage to you? Maybe you're sitting there and thinking, you know, actually, I feel I'm getting what I want, but this is a church seminar. If I don't come, um, Dick and Terry will be asking me why I didn't come. So I just, I'll just come back. As far as I'm concerned, my marriage is really happy. What is a happy marriage? Now, let's start. Now, a true happy marriage is where God is there. The same couple at the bottom, thumbs up, but it's where God is there. It is a God-centered marriage. A God-centered marriage. They say, Pastor, we know that. <laughs> we hear that all the time. But what is it? What does it mean? But what does it mean to have a God-centered marriage where God is there? What does it mean? Now, the definition of a happy marriage. First and foremost, we are going to build the seminar very much on two sets of verses, all right? Now, the first one is this, Psalm 127, verse 1. Now, shall we read it together? A song of, Solom a song of degrees for Solomon. Except the Lord built the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman waketh, but in vain. Now, we are one to build a happy home. So, we have to begin here. And the Bible tells us this, and I hope we are, we notice the word accept. Accept. Unless it is God that builds the house. All your labor to build a happy home is going to be in vain. It will, it will vaporize to nothingness. It will eventually crumble. You can feel, you can think that you're happy, but as long as it is not the Lord that is building the house, you build it in vain. What does it mean to say, well, where God is a God-centered marriage? A God-centered marriage is one that you say, Lord, you must be the one who built our house. So it begins with this. You can try to build your house on your own. You can set your own specifications. You can have your own blueprints based on your desire. Just like if you happen to well, build your own house and say, this is how I want it to be. All these kind of conveniences, this is how I want it to be arranged. Well, everything is about what you design and you build. It is not God that built the house. It is you. It is not really the builder that built the house. It's not really the architect. They are just following your specifications. It's you that is building your own house. So first, it must begin with God is the center of the home. Then God is the designer, builder, a designer, architect, and builder. He must be the one. It begins there. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, God says, after he, well, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 and keep our, 
bookmark there, right? We are going to refer to this a fair bit. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Uh, let's read for context, all right? Shall we read for context 27 to 28? 27 to 28 of chapter 1 of Genesis reading. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And, well, alright, so here, now we have the situation where God created man and woman and in verse 28, and he blessed them. Now, this will be talking about the marriage. He blessed them. God brought them together, blessed them in marriage, which, which is what we read. So the expansion of this, uh, the expansion of what happens between 27 to 28 is really found in chapter 2. All right, chapter 2 that we read um, from verses 21 to 24. Understand? So God gave an overall summary in chapter 1 and about that he simply created men and women and he blessed them. But in chapter 2, he describes the marriage, how he formed the marriage, how he created the woman and formed the marriage. Now, but notice that in chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them. God blessed them. Now, when God blesses somebody, we understand, we understand what that means. Now, it means God, have, God has, well, good thoughts towards them and will have good actions, spiritually beneficial actions towards them. So when God bless marriage about this man leaving um, father and mother, cleave unto his wife and be one flesh, when God bless marriage, it means that God actually gave marriage something that is good, in fact, very good, as we'll see. A blessing from God means it's something that God intends it to be wonderful. Marriage is supposed to be wonderful. And you say, well, but it is not wonderful in my, my marriage, in my parents' marriage. Why so? Why so? Now, what is the design by the designer will answer that question? Why is my marriage not happy? What makes a good marriage? The important thing is to understand the designer's intent. God is the one who designed marriage, not mankind. Please remember that. God designed, God created marriage and he designed it. And when God designed marriage, he blessed that marriage. Remember when, look at chapter 1, verse 28, this is before the fall, and God blessed men and, um, God, sorry, verse 28, and God blessed them. This is before the fall. God blessed marriage. God invented, created, um, for marriage, designed it, and he said it is something that is wonderful. Now, what is the intention of God in his design that makes it wonderful. What is it? The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So marriage is meant to be good. And Adam gave names to the cattle and to the fowls of the feast, but for, and, and so on, but for Adam there was no found and help meet for him. So God looked at that. I want to create and I intended to create marriage for Adam. I intend for Merim, Adam, no, madam, Adam to get married, all right? Now, and furthermore, God says, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. So all these things are, are good and obtain favor of the Lord. It's blessed of the Lord, obtains favor of the Lord. God promised, God does promise that every Christian marriage will be good and happy. He does. He does. But please remember this. I have not answered the question, what makes a happy marriage? I just want to build this up to make sure you understand. Now, good, a good marriage, a happy marriage, now it doesn't mean that just marrying someone will result in a good marriage. God designed marriage to be good. Does it mean that as long as I marry someone, then I just know, know that everything will be good. It will naturally be good. Well, obviously not. God warns that there are bad marriages. All right, bad marriages. For example, here, all right, um, a foolish son is the calamity of his father. The, contentious, the, the contentions of a wife are continual dropping. Now, if you have a wife that is contentious all the time, it's like a constant distress. 
I have this water pipe outside my bedroom. And whenever it rains, it tuk, tuk, tuk. And at night, it somehow amplifies the sound. All right? Every time that comes, I say, yeah, this is, it, it affects your sleep. You can have a house full of riches and so on. And a prudent wife is from the Lord. All right? So the spouse, a bad spouse rather, will contribute, will create a bad marriage, an unhappy marriage. It can be the man, all right, being unfaithful to the wife of his um, youth, his, his covenant, causes bad marriage. Now, God's will is always good, all right, just in case the single still think, uh, you know, it is true, it looks very bad. I really don't want to get married. Just look at my parents' life. God intends for marriage to be good. Marriage can be good, although there are bad marriages and God knows and God does mention about them. Now, so it comes to this. Marriage, according to God's design, will be very happy. Now, okay, don't look at this. Look at your Bible instead. Look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Now, I want you to take note. All right, Genesis chapter 1, in verse 25. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. All right? At this point, God said it's good. You know when God says good, it is like, wow, right? It's good. But it did not become very good until God made man and blessed marriage. Now, look at verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, this very good is after verse, after verse 28, and God blessed them. Now, when God formed mankind, before it fell, and when God designed marriage and blessed it, it was then that God says, now creation has something that now I would say is very good. When God says it's very good, it is beyond happy marriage. It's, it's wonderful. It's beyond imagination. So marriage is supposed to be very good. It's make, it makes mankind to be able to say now it, the creation now is very good, not just good. It is very good. Now, I mentioned earlier on, what makes a marriage a happy marriage, a blessed marriage, all right? The word happy, blessed, a blessed marriage. What will it be? It is going to be dependent on the design, the design. God designed marriage and he called it very good. Understand that? I hope you're following me. God designed marriage and then now he calls creation very good. Then it has to do with the design of marriage. When you buy a, an, uh, uh, something, a machinery, or an equipment for your house use, now is it good or is it very good? How do you differentiate? The design. The design. All right? What makes something far better than another product very often is in the design itself. People pay a lot more for products can be of the same um, um, make, but it's the design, the nuances in there that makes certain things far better than the other. So you pay a lot more for a certain product, although another product seems to do the same thing, but you're paying for the design. A lot of money, company spends huge amount of money. To be successful, they know that R&D, Research and design is one of the most important departments. You pour enough money into R&D, you get the design well, right, very good out there, you are going to beat the competition. So people know even in the world, the business world, research and design is critical. They spend billions of dollars there, research and design. So design is what makes something very good and God designed marriage. So now I ask you, what is a good marriage? Look at this verse, so like, now, Genesis 23 to 24. Let's read together. And Adam said, 
This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. All right? So here, when God blessed the marriage, all right, the Bible tells us that this was said. Either God himself said it or Adam himself said it, but this was made clear. This was the design of marriage. So now here is where I ask you a question. What do you think is the critical design of marriage? What do you think it is? Kelvin, what is the design that is so critical? One flesh. So fast, very fast. One flesh. One flesh is the design of God in marriage. So when God designed marriage, He intended it to be one flesh. What makes a happy marriage is when it meets this design. What makes a product very good when it's launched out there? Whether it is exactly as designed, then it will work. And it will work perfectly and it will be very good. The design. So Christian, first and foremost, you have to accept a good marriage is not what the world thinks, it's not what you think, it is the design of God. A one flesh marriage. It begins here. Now, is God's defin- what is, is God's definition of one flesh? Now the question is, what is one flesh? Is one flesh always being together? This is not a picture of a lonely person, a lonely spouse. Huh? This is wherever the person goes, there's a shadow following, right? So always together. Right? It's not lonely. Wherever you go, the shadow is there, right? So always together. Ah, that is one flesh. Right, husband? When I go to the supermarket, why are you at home doing all this? Come with me. We are one flesh, right? And the husband, when you watch football games, hey, wife, come sit with me. We must be one flesh. Right? Or even serving, even if your husband or wife can be doing something. No, we must be together, one flesh. Now we are one flesh. Is that what it is? Is it doing fun things together? All right? hey, you know, we are really one flesh, you know. I don't like to go on holidays and unless my husband or my wife is with me. Is that one flesh? We often think that's what it is. That looks like a happy marriage. Wow, look at this couple. All right? They're always together. You see one, you see the other. Shadow. Now, what is unity in one flesh? This is what it is. Um, I wish I put it separately. Now, let's read Philippians 1.27. When God talks about oneness, God describes this oneness. Let's read together. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. When God talks about the church being one, when he talks about people being one, all right? Now, these are brought up, three aspects in oneness. So what is this when God designs oneness, when God, one, when God desires oneness? It is one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So here, what is one flesh? The definition from the Bible is one spirit. Now, it talks about one in purpose. One in purpose. All right? So, when it comes to the purpose of everything, we are one on it. We may not be always together, but when it comes to the purpose of our marriage, there's absolutely never a disagreement. One mind talks about one in priorities. We are always one-minded about this. This is always the most important thing. We do not need to argue about this. One in purpose. Now, but remember, there is striving together, not striving against each other. The oneness in what you strive for in your life, the pursuit, the pursuit. And all this must be summarized by the purpose is always about the faith of the gospel, all right? About the Christian spiritual pr- uh, priorities. So the priorities, the purpose, the priorities, and the pursuit is always to be is always to be for the faith of the gospel. It is not this. Here is all right. It is not. We are one in purpose, one in, one in priority, and one in um, our pursuit of the world. You can be very one in that, but it's not for the faith of the gospel. Though you are very one, very much one, 
But it's not God's design of oneness. God's design of oneness is these three areas, the three Ps, is for the faith of the gospel. It is about me, making me happy. We are very one about that, right? You manage to make your spouse so afraid of you, you always get what you want. It is not about, even about, we are one in purpose to make sure that, no, let's not be so serious, huh, spouse. We are very one about this. It's the world and God. It's not just God only, right? It's always the world and God, all right? So let's not be so serious. We don't need to be at every Bible study to, to learn and grow more and more about God, right? But our child must go to school every day. But we don't have to go for every, every Bible study. But our child must go to school every day. We are one about that. We are one and of God and the world. Now, when we say oneness, when you say, I want to have a happy marriage, it must be the design of God. That design must ring true. And the design is what we see here, that oneness, that one flesh. When God builds the house, what was the design of the house? The design of the house was supposed to be exactly this, one flesh. Right in the beginning, right in the beginning, when God blessed marriage and God says now it's very good, why? Because he said, they shall be one flesh. You design it in any other way, your own way. You can even be very one, but your end purpose in purpose, in priorities, in pursuit is not a spiritual one. You are going to have an unhappy marriage. Why is your ma marriage unhappy? A, a company that produces something after spending a lot of time in R&D and know this is the, the highest perfect specs and this is the perfect design, when it goes out, it's going to be wonderful. It will work and beat all the competition, all right? Why would it fail? It will only fail if the, if the engineers involved don't follow the design. You know, I think, I know the designer designed it this way, but you know, we can do it this way, we can make it this way and that, uh, that way. We can achieve the best of both worlds. It will fail. So the design of one flesh is what makes a happy marriage. Now, then I will summarize it. What is a happy marriage? A happy marriage is one that is one in purpose, priority and pursuit to fulfill and obey God's will for marriage, God's design for marriage, God's commands in marriage to individual couples. That is the definition in the Bible of what constitutes a happy marriage, the design of God. And what is it? One flesh. And what is one flesh? These things. All right? Oops, sorry. It is not mere outward unity. There must be an inward spiritual union first and foremost. This must be a genuine, sincere thing. We often focus only the externals, all right? Which I'll give examples of soon. Now, so when I summarize, what is a happy marriage? When you come to this seminar, it is a spiritually fulfilled and fulfilling marriage. Spiritually fulfilled. When it comes to purpose, priorities, and pursuit, we are one about that. So the marriage is really spiritually fulfilled. It's very fulfilled. I may not, we may not have many things that our colleagues have in terms of time, money, holidays, clothes, cars, whatever it is. We may not have that. But my definition now about a happy marriage is, is spiritually fulfilled in this one flesh. As long as we are singular in our heart in this um, three Ps, it is a happy marriage. And not only that, it's a fulfilling marriage, a spiritually fulfilling marriage. It is not, well, if I have things, then I will be fulfilled. If I have things, then, well, we are fulfilling a happy marriage. No. It continues it's fulfilling. It's very fulfilling to your own heart. It's very fulfilling to the heart of your children. Very fulfilling to the heart of your wife. It is not only a spiritually fulfilled marriage where all the desires are aligned, but it's so fulfilling. That is the meaning of a happy marriage. A marriage that is blessed of the Lord. So let me ask you some questions. 
I know it's a bit small, but I hope you can see. Now, are the following enough to make a happy marriage? Yes, just focus on our commonalities. Well, you know, if I want to marry someone, as long as we focus on our commonalities, we are Christian, well, we love to evangelize, um, we love holiness, uh, we love fellowshipping with people, um, we just talk about commonalities. The differences should be just swept under the carpet and don't think about this. Well, you are one. You are one in many things, but you're not one in all things. You're not one flesh. Don't fall into this self um, um, delusion and self comforting um, um, deception of yourself. Just focus on the commonalities. No, one flesh is totally one in all purposes, in all priorities, and in all uh, pursuits. Well, are they falling enough? Oh, yes. Yes, we agree that what the Bible says about marriage, headship and submission. Oh, we agree that. Just big picture, right? I'm, I believe in submission as a woman. He believes, or the man, I believe that I must be a spiritual leader. Oh, that, is, that is common. That is enough. Is that enough? Or we agree which church to go to after we get married. Now, the worst is this. I, well, let's just agree first. And after we get married, well, I can still win my spouse over. You know, there is, there is this thing that we say we should never do, evangelistic courtship, right? Get married to an unbeliever, then, win, then intend to win them over after marriage. Now, you cannot enter into marriage taking a vow to be one. Because that question is asked. You cannot take a vow to be one when in your heart, you, you, you basically in your heart say, well, you know, I... I'm really not one in spirit with him, all right? The convictions, the purpose, I'm really not one with her. But never mind, just focus on the commonalities and get married. Please know the design of God is a genuine oneness. Now, I'm speaking to, to singles, of course, but also to the married. Now, if you look at your marriage and you realize there is not this singular oneness in all these three Ps, that is the reason why your marriage is not happy or it will soon not be happy. Because there will be conflict that will arise in, in time. Think about this. When you have children, to infant baptize or not to infant baptize. When they grow up, can you, if you have a difference in conviction, can you teach the child otherwise against your own conscience? So please know, the design of one flesh is a genuine oneness. If it is not there, do not get married because it will fail. You do not want to adopt God's design and you think that you will be ha have a happy marriage. Or for those who are married, you think that, well, we don't have to be totally one on spiritual things. You're only fooling yourself. What else? Well, yes, well, as long as I remain true in my heart to my beliefs and tell the others, well, I still believe in this. I still believe that, well, you know, Christians should, uh, the, the, other, the spouse must be a Christian. I, I always believe in that. But I get, I'll get married first and then try to convert. But in my heart, I always believe that Christians should marry Christians. There's no use saying Christians should marry Christians and then you go ahead and do otherwise and just say, I still believe in something. Christians, you must understand design. Keep going back to design. It's a genuine oneness. You cannot say, well, I'll get married. Um, in marriage, there's always give and take, right? Big picture, always give and take. So we don't need to be one. But God says, I designed them to be one flesh. You are telling God, God, there's always give and take. We don't have to be one. If we don't have convictions on the things we differ on, it's okay. We still can have a happy marriage. Then God says in vain. God says in vain. God says in vain about this. Even for a church. Don't talk about a marriage which you live every day, day in and day out together. You make critical decisions that affect your own destiny and your child's destiny that is so intimately tied to that. Even for a church, God says this is the meaning of oneness. And you think in marriage, you can defy that design. We don't need to be one in convictions. 
Now this, one in spirit, the purpose is driven from conviction. Please know that. You don't have genuine conviction about something, then the purpose goes out the window. The pursuit goes out the window. Convictions are critical. Now that is why we say it many times, and I hope that we, you do not forget this. The design is genuine oneness. If there is no genuine oneness, the marriage will fail. It's just a matter of time. Like I mentioned about convictions. Can you live against your conscience all your life? When your children, when children come, you find that you can't practice your faith. You find that you can't teach your faith to the child. You bring the child to church, the child keeps hearing something that is against your conscience. You want to live such a life? Now you understand why God says there is no happy marriage unless there is oneness. In theology, oneness in practices, beliefs in the practices, they must be there. Don't defy God's model and think it will be fine. All right? So my core beliefs, the practice of the faith of my spouse, well, now if you say they are more important to me than getting married, then you should not get married. Now I want to say here that maybe, or well, someone said, Pastor, you know, maybe you need to be clearer about this. And I thought maybe it's true. It's time to now, I've drawn the picture, now I need to draw the intestines, right? some, and some people say. Um, make it very, very obvious, very clear. Now, unless you are someone, let me flash this, all right? Now, unless you are someone who feels that after going through the spreadsheet to settle the key convictions that are non-negotiable to you, Unless after you've done that, you say, I can put aside all this, it won't trouble me. I put aside all my key convictions, it won't trouble me. When I get married, when these things happen, it won't trouble me. I can, I can happily embrace my husband or my wife's beliefs and practices, it won't affect me. In fact, I will happily, in fact, promote what they believe, teach what they believe to other people and to other children. And when we evangelize together, I will happily teach these things that, well, once used to be something that were my key convictions. Unless you are someone who is like that in those areas, you cannot fulfill the design because you are really not one with your spouse. Unless you're someone who says, when these things happen, it, it is fine. Well, to the point where you're ready to even renounce what you believe. If those things you say, even in these key convictions, I can renounce them. I can say that I don't feel there is a need uh, to, to practice biblical separation. I can renounce that. I can support this new church that, I'm, that my wife or my husband is in, I can support it. I can get, use, use um, my resources, my energy to support it. I can renounce these things. I can renounce um, uh, the, the belief in a perfect Bible. It doesn't trouble me each Sunday when you read, when they read from other versions and the pastor says that, well, you know, this part you're not in the Bible. It's fine with me. It doesn't trouble me. Then you can be one flesh with your spouse. But if it does, those of you who are getting married, now please make sure that you understand what I'm saying when I say, use the spreadsheet, go through the key, non-negotiables. I'm not just saying inform the person about the non-negotiable. I'm not saying inform. I'm saying settle. And when I say settle, this is where I draw the intestines. It means you're ready to, even to the point of, not just, well, I, it, it won't trouble me. I will embrace it. I will even teach it. I am even ready to renounce my key convictions. If not, you cannot fulfill the design. You are trying to force a square peg into a round hole or a round, or a, a, a round peg into a square hole, like I've written in the pastoral earlier on. This is the reality. So the design is critical for a happy marriage. Then those who are entering marriage, now be clear about this. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Now, does it mean that we, 
we cannot have disagreement about whether pork is nicer or beef is nicer. We cannot have disagreements uh, before marriage and in marriage about whether um, sleeping on the left side or right side of the bed or whatever it is, you know, the color scheme of the house. Now, we are not talking about that because the oneness is about for the gospel, for the... Sorry, where is it? I'm talking about what God talks about, the faith of the gospel. All right, so please don't go away thinking that, well, you know, pastors say that if, if the guy doesn't like um, beef and I like beef, well, we are, we are not going to be one flesh. This is about for the faith of the gospel. When it comes to theology and the practice of your faith, that is what it is. All right, so don't, don't go to the other extreme and begin to think that, well, I think I better not get married because I can't find anyone to be totally one flesh with me. All right, please understand what it is about. Now, marriage is indeed wonderful. Marriage is indeed wonderful. I do not want people to think otherwise, that the church seems to paint marriage as something so, so foreboding, so terrible. I am making it very clear. God blessed it. God called it very good. After he blessed marriage, he said the whole creation now is very good. All right? I never thought I would say this, but I do want to say it. I'm kind of concerned why people are not getting married. All right? But I am a pastor. I tell you, I do not match make. Because match, match, matches are made in heaven, right? Fires are made on earth. <laughs> you know what it means. You matches, you know the fire match? Matches are made in heaven. When God matches, it's perfect. Fire is made on earth. If I match make, I think I will create matches that will create like fires. I don't believe in that, but I want to teach you. Marriage is wonderful. Know the understanding. Meet the design. And if God's will for you to marriage, look forward to it. But if you're not willing to meet the design, is fire on earth. Now, um, let's go on. Now, are the following excuses or are they genuine for a happy marriage? Yes, there's always give and take in marriage anyway. When you say that, please make sure it's genuine. If you say, yeah, really, when it comes to convictions, there's give and take as well. There's no such thing as give and take when it comes to theology, unless it's something that absolutely not important or not important to you, right? But you see, for example, is it immersion or is it sprinkling? To one, it is so important it affects church membership and holy communion. To another, well, it's okay. Both are fine. How are you going to settle that? Are you going to be one flesh about that? Yes, if we don't have convictions. Now, I, I bring this up because this is the history of many churches, especially this church. I bring this up because we've seen marriages fail. We've seen marriages break down. We've seen children growing, growing up confused. All because parents think all, it met, all that matters is we love one another. All that matters is we focus on the commonalities. It's a deception. A de engineer can say all it matters is we just focus on what we want to do well, what we don't want to do, let's just forget it. You will still need to get involved in that part eventually. Those eventualities will come. There's always give and take. Don't use it as an excuse because you want to get married. Getting married is the most important thing. But yet in your heart, you want to hold on to certain convictions that is contrary to your spouse. You are not going to meet the design. And this is, a, yeah, even if we have done co different convictions, it's okay. We still can form good marriages. Look at so-and-so, look at so-and-so, look at so-and-so. For one that worked, there are hundreds that did not work. Please understand that. There are so many. Until today, I still see them. People that have been in our church, married with, without sorting out the convictions. And they say, as long as we love each other, things will work out. Till today. Even people from our congregation, when they begin to hear, well, doctrines, theology that follows, uh, that practices that follow, preach openly on the pulpit, they struggle. One agrees, one like it, the other disagree. Until today, they are still looking for churches. They are still going from one church to another to another church, not just BPCWA. I know of such couples in other BP churches as well. Why? Why? The most happy thing is to worship together. Even that cannot be so because they did not follow the design, the oneness, genuine oneness. Now, we can say that 
Yeah, so I say this again, right? So make sure you understand. I'm not saying that you must be 100% in agreement in 100% of everything before marriage to be happy, all right? Don't generalize this statement and use them as excuses to ease your conscience later. But at the same time, no. Um, I want to say you don't have to be um, in, you do not need to be in the agreement as one flesh in areas of your non-negotiable core agreements, right? If you really feel I really do not really care. If I'm, if I'm in a BP church, they talk about infant baptism, I'm fine. I will practice it. And if I go to uh, my, my wife's church and they don't believe in infant baptism and practice, um, that, I am fine too. It, it really doesn't matter to me. Well, that's different. Okay? And I'm definitely not talking about your everyday thing like um, color of your bed sheets and all that kind of thing. You must be 100% in agreement. I'm not talking about that. So ultimately, God reminds us, reinforces Amos 3.3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? You know the answer. God is asking a rhetorical question. Even in the New Testament, God emphasizes, wherefore there are no more twain. You are not more two person with different convictions of faith when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the faith of the gospel. You are no longer two persons. God in the New Testament re re reiterate, wherefore there are no more twain but one flesh because that is my design and that's the only way it's going to work. That's the only way it's going to be happy. Can two persons be agreed, walk together? Well, some say, as long as we love each other, we will be happy. I know better than the God who designed marriage and who re-emphasized it in Amos 3.3. 3. I know better than God. I've seen some marriage work. God is not absolutely right. It's a foolish thing. It's like an engineer who still says, I know better than the designer. I just make this change, right? It will still work out. And then it's a disaster eventually, right? Now, God says it very clearly. And if a house be divided against, what others? Against itself. That house, that house cannot stand. We see that in many marriages. Do not cite one and say it worked. It's the same as citing someone marrying an unbeliever and it worked. And you say, well, this is the way. A good and happy marriage is one that is equal in yoke, equal in spirituality, equal in convictions, equal in the desires for spiritual things. If not, the Bible paints this picture, the unequal yoke. A donkey and a cow plowing the field, there will always be angry faces, unhappy faces, problems. And the whole field either is not plowed or will be in a mess. God uses all these very clear pictures to make us see the design of one flesh, the three Ps regarding the gospel, the Christian living, the spiritual things. They must be intact. That is the definition. When you have that, that's the definition of a happy marriage, even if you don't have everything else that the world says is needed for a happy marriage. All right? So we must make... Um, Marriages, um, uh, we must have a clear definition and understanding of what is a happy marriage. It begins there. The design of one flesh. Now then I come to this. Now marriages are not for ourselves. Marriages are to serve God. When God blessed the marriage. Now turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Now, when did God assign them things to do for him? I repeat, when did God assign the Adam and Eve, the married couple, to do things for him? Look at verse 27. Uh, sorry, verse 28. And, he, and God blessed them. Now, after blessing the marriage, he sends them out. To fulfill his will. In verse 28, be fruitful 
multiply and replenish the earth. When he blessed the marriage, it was a one flesh marriage, one in the three Ps, all right? The purpose, the pursuits, uh, the priorities and the pursuits. There was one in that. And with that, he said, go out and build godly homes. Go out and build godly, be fruitful and multiply. You cannot have a godly home to bring up godly seed. That is blessed of God. That is a happy one. Unless you really say, I am going to be totally one flesh with my spouse. Then he tells them to serve, right? To do things together. So please know, when God bless it and they say, now go and serve me. Marriage is not for yourselves. Don't think that marriage, I have a happy marriage when what I want, when even when I feel that my marriage is, is spiritual, but you are not useful to God. You are not bringing godly seed, but it, well, it looks spiritual enough. You have everything that is nice. Marriage is not for yourself. The Bible says where we, whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Together. Where you live, you live together as one flesh. Till death do us part. Till you die. Then die, you die unto the Lord. It's always about God. Marriage is that. Is it, um, is it shocking to you? Disappointing to you? That marriage is all about God and your, you, both of you must be singular in heart about that? Is it now a disappointment? Are you, did you come to this session hoping to know how to talk better, we speak better to one another, less quarrels at home? Now, those are important. But until you get this right, there is no blessed, happy marriage until it meets the design of one flesh. The absolute oneness in purpose, in pursuit, in priorities regarding spiritual things. Well, maybe I give you an example now. When you first get married, you talk on big, high level. Yeah, we both want to love God. We both want to be holy. But if there was no genuine oneness with respect to the pursuit of God, after you get married, after some time, you want to do family devotion, then your wife feels that it's too long. I say, wow, this is so exciting to talk about this, to talk about God. Or you begin to say, now let us prioritize, all right, the study of God's word. Well, you know, if you take FEB courses, means less time for candlelight dinners, less time for holidays. We'll be very busy. Then when it comes to um, um, the, the, the pursuing Right, of spiritual growth. We don't need to be that serious. We don't need to go that far. Now you begin to understand why God says this oneness is critical. It's critical. Otherwise, it's an unequal yoke. We would have some case studies, God willing, um, to see situations like that. All right? So now you understand when God says oneness, please believe me, is the only thing that will work. You experience it in your own life. Are you becoming unhappy now at home? Because you want to run faster with God, but your spouse doesn't want to? Now, we come to... So that is the key thing, all right? What is a happy marriage? You, you, I hope you're clear, clear by now. Now we come to the second part, all right, before the break. Now, now, knowing that the design, having the design is what is defined as a happy marriage. If we are one in, in this... We have a happy marriage, no matter what the world thinks, no matter what the world sees. This is a biblically happy marriage. Now then, now how to have, how to build upon this, how to keep um, ensuring this becomes stronger and stronger, the, the foundation. What is the foundation? What do you think it is? How to build a happy marriage? Now I said we built it on one of these key verse. Except the Lord built the house. They labor in vain that build it. Now it means this. Use God's blueprint for the foundation. First, you know God's design. God's design of a happy marriage is one flesh. And hope you're clear about one flesh now. And you're honest about it. Now, knowing that, how to make sure that we do have a marriage that is one flesh? Use God's blueprint for the foundation. 
Now, when the Bible says, except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain. Now, this is not about God is involved with the building with you. God is involved right from the beginning. That is what it means. Right from the beginning, He's the builder that designed the house. That's what it means the Lord built the house. You labor to build it, but He built the house by designing it. Now, not only that, He designs what kind of foundation will make the house truly one flesh. I repeat, He designs what kind of foundation that will truly make the house really solid, one piece, unmovable when the wind comes, when the storm comes. It will stand firm. One. What, what is that foundation for that, for that building? If you don't use, if you um, do not use God's blueprint for the foundation, well, you are going to build in vain. You can say, I want all this, but it'll be in vain. Now, how to have a happy marriage? A marriage between two Christians who obey God's will, God's design, and God's command. All right? What is it about, Really? What is it about, really? We say all these general, high-level things. Now, I'm going to show you the picture. I'm going to show you the picture of one flesh. What God gives as the best picture of one flesh. So God says, you want to imagine what is one flesh? You want to know how to be one flesh? I give you the perfect picture. What is it? Now, let me ask Alex. What is the perfect picture of one flesh that God gave to us. One in Christ, okay. Um, but God can say that between singles, you must be one in Christ. But they are singles. I'm talking about marriage. Sing Yun. Sing Yun. What's the perfect picture of one flesh? The perfect picture of one flesh that if you follow that, that is your blueprint. Um, John, John C. Humbing. God gave us a perfect picture of one flesh. Say again. Christ. Say again. Can't hear you. Trinity. Well, the Trinity, they are not in marriage, right? Not husband and wife. Ellen. Christ and the church. Christ and the church. When it comes to marriage, what is one flesh? Let's read together. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You know, to depict Christ and the church, to depict Christ and his bride, what did the apostle bring up? The marriage words said in Genesis, in the first marriage. When God designed it and said it would be one flesh. How to teach my church? Paul thinks. And the Holy Spirit gives him this word. Go back to Genesis when it comes to marriage. Well, that is the perfect analogy for marriage. Christ and the church. You want to know how this blueprint look like? This one flesh? How to build, how to follow this blueprint? Follow this example of Christ and the church. You know the design. Now you have the blueprint to start following, to build. The one flesh in marriage reflects the relationship between Christ and the church. The Bible is very clear about that. Even in the Old Testament, for thy maker is thine husband, you see, when it comes to this, it's about Christ and God and, and man. He describes marriage. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. The maker is your husband. Right? There's always this relationship between God and his people. In other words, his church. Depicting to marriage what it should be. The foundation of a happy marriage then is this, where each fulfills their role. Why do I say that? Therefore, let's read Ephesians 5, 24, 25 together reading. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
Love husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, you see the picture? The church is subject unto Christ. Then let the wives be there. That's a blueprint to achieve oneness. For the husbands, your blueprint is this. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. It's always about Christ and the church. See, you don't know how? Look there. Christ and the church. When it comes to submission, Christ and the church. When it comes to husbands, Christ and the church. And what is that blueprint telling us where each fulfill their roles? The blueprint for a happy marriage is where there is headship and submission. Where there is headship and submission, that is that building um, a structure foundation in order to meet this one flesh. Simple reason. Maybe I ask you why. Why do you think it must be like that? Ichung, why must there be hatred and submission for one flesh to be true? Of course. Otherwise, there will be conflict. One flesh means you do not have conflict when it comes to purpose, pursuit and priorities when it comes to spiritual things. But the moment there is no headship, that say, when it comes to spiritual pursuits, priorities, and purposes, someone will lead, and the other person will say, yes, I will follow. Otherwise, it will be conflict all the time. This is the blueprint. God did not make headship and submission because he thought that man is um, spiritually superior than woman. God knows that for this designed to work. This is how it must function. Otherwise, the gears will mash. All right? It will be, um, there will be chaos. This is for the design to work. That is all. So Christian, I know you think, oh, sorry, so I, re I want to re-emphasize, all right? The God's blueprint for a happy marriage is fulfilling the model by fulfilling your role. By fulfilling your role. I've mentioned this quite a few times, and now you know the secret to answer that question. When you say, I want to marry someone, I say, why do you want to marry this person? If a lot of the answers is about, because this person makes me happy, because this person makes me feel loved, because this person um, fulfills my needs, then you are not going to follow the blueprint because it's all about you. It's about fulfilling your needs, not you fulfilling your roles. Now, until you are clear in your heart, because I want to fulfill my role to this person in marriage, because that is how the blueprint of one flesh begins. I want to fulfill my role to the other person. That is the right answer to why you want to get married. Now, if you're planning to get married, you want to get married, or you are in marriage, if you're planning to get married and say, you know, because I need to get married. Is I need to get married? I need someone to take care of me when I'm old. I'm afraid to be alone. I need this, I need that. And you know, I found a person that best can help me with those things. You are marrying for yourself to meet all your needs. But God's blueprint is, husband, you meet your expectations in this design. Wife, you meet your expectations in this design. That is how this building is going to be strong and happy. All right? So, don't just give the right answer. Oh, pastor, because I want to fulfill my role as a wife. I want to fulfill my role as a husband. But the rest in your heart, you know, it is not true. All right? You're looking for someone to fulfill what you are needing and what you're afraid that you will not have. That is all. You will fail. You will fail. Now, God's solution is the true antidote. Of course, there must be salvation. I have to say this. Some spouses, if you feel that no matter what you do, there cannot be oneness. Why? Because the person 
may not be saved. When the person is not saved, why would the person want to prioritize God? Why would the person want to make spiritual pursuits, uh, spiritual, uh, his purpose in life, and only purpose in life as just simply all about God? Why would a person want to do that unless he's saved or she is saved? Check your own salvation, husband. Check your own salvation, wife. If you struggle with this understanding of it is one in spiritual things and that's the priority, everything is about God and I cannot take that. You may not be saved. That is why there will never be peace at home. The only sadness. So I ask you this question, why do you enter into marriage? I mentioned just now, the world very often is because they want a romantic marriage. They want a romantic spouse. Willingly, now I took this definition from um, mind, body, green, all right? Now, well, what am I, where am I looking for? Regularly show me how much they love me, how much they adore me, all right? Well, well some may say, well, mindful of the other person's significant needs and desire, but it's passionate, thoughtful way. The other person, not God's, not God's. This sounds right. But to the world, they are not talking about mindful of their needs and desires and passionate about God and being thoughtful about this. No, it is not. It is not for the faith of the gospel. The most important thing people look for is, oh, well, this person is very attentive to me, um, very, um, always thrills me. You know, modern times is associated with all this idea of romance. Now, this, this definition... Oops. Now, um, so, th someone tried to de define... Uh, uh, what is romance, all right? And he said, a connection between two people that bonds them as a couple creates the conditions of overturning the model of the marriage. Um, well, actually, can I shrink this? The key words are, out, are missing. Well, basically what I'm trying to say is, is that they said, well, it is about this romance between them, all right? Um, that they feel for one another, that kind of thing. Now, this is romance, but even unbelievers rightly point out. Now, if it is just mainly about this connection between two people, no, there's no higher purpose or, or spirituality, it's always about them and this connection. Even unbelievers say it creates the conditions of overturning the family and marriage that it engenders. What it's trying to say, people that promote romance for a good marriage is actually overturning what they're trying to maintain as a good marriage. Romance is all about me, about me feeling good. There is no common purpose except me. That is why it will never work. Even unbelievers believe that that will not work. It's about individual fulfilling their roles to another. That is what will work. Now, I'm not saying for a moment there should be no romance in marriage, all right? But if, if romance is all you think is what's going to make your marriage work, you are simply going to say it's everything about me. For example, well, um, government of Western Australia, the world tells us what relationship should be. I feel safe. We must feel safe. We totally support them. My partner respects me, all right? But this is very much about me and my personal pursuits. I feel safe. Now, if you're talking about violence, of course you must feel safe. Well, but I feel safe that I can, well, pursue what I want, do whatever I want, and he will or she will support me in whatever I want, then it's different. We honestly say what we think, we should. But this is the meaning of, I tell you what I want and I want you to follow me, all right? But we should be honest. Maybe one day, God willing, we'll cover communication in marriage. That's one of very important part, and I always want to do that. God willing, we'll do that one day, communication. I have my own friends, I do my own things, I do what I want, right? The government said, this is what makes a healthy marriage relationship. You do whatever you want. And the other person must respect that you should do whatever you want. We are not one flesh. Well, my, um, I can say no to sex, that is contrary to the, the Bible. Now, we are not talking about um, um, force and all that. You know that, all right? But the Bible says we should not withhold our body from one another, all right? Except it be for some spiritual reason for a short time. But if we say, well, rape in marriage, of course we say it is wrong. My partner and I decide things together. He said, isn't that good? Yes, it's together. Usually the emphasis means we are equal. There's no such thing as hate, ship, and submission. 
This is how the world thinks. The model, the blueprint in many areas are very contrary. Right? Maybe you imbibe some of those. Now, each person has their own opportunity, their own self. Both are independent, have self-esteem. Now, this is taken from How to Build Enduring Relationship, right? Um, by, by some writers writing about how to have a good marriage. You must have your own opportunity, your own career goals, your independent, your own high self-esteem. Both partners, well, submit that is not high self-esteem. Both partners pursue self-understanding, self-development, discovering of real self. Both are involved in responsible, real self and romance. Now, all this is about self, 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 self. You, you begin to see the very blueprint that God says, it is about each playing your role to the other is turned into self. You understand how successful Satan has has uh, been able to um, damage and destroy marriage and make marriages unhappy is because of all this propaganda that he sends out. And Christians begin to believe that. Oneness? No. We must be independent. Submission? No. I must have high self-esteem. I'm somebody better than my husband. Um, and, and so on. This is how marriages are destroyed because of failure to follow the blueprint. The world has no concept of sin. They have no concept of sin. Sin is the thing that causes unhappiness in marriage. The sin of not willing to submit to God's design and follow God's model of roles. That is the reason why marriages fail. But they don't have no concept of sin. So to them, they will continue to pursue that. All right? Now, we're going to have a break soon, but I just want to finish a couple of slides and then we'll go for a break. Now then the question is this. Is a marriage, a happy marriage, still possible with real life responsibilities? Is it possible? Health problems as you age. Children may be disobedient, have problems, right? Uncontrollable. Growing old, worrying about so many things as you grow old stress of life, right? Look at the picture of even children are stressed, are sad about how things are at home. That's the reality of the world. We are faced with all these kind of pressures in the world. Is it still possible to have a happy marriage? Are we just talking theory? Is it possible? I answer this, no. It is not possible if it had always been about me, me, me. The roles, when you read it, is always about the other party, the other party, the other party in God. It is not possible. Until you relinquish the idea and submit to this fact, you cannot build a happy marriage or have one. Yes, yes, with all these difficulties in life, it is possible if it is all about God, God, God. If you're honest, you know. Your marriage is not happy because it has been very much not about God, God, God. Maybe it's you're happy as a spouse, but your, the other spouse is not happy. Is that a happy marriage? God's design is always correct. One flesh marriage is not about you. It's not even about your marriage. It is one flesh in spiritual commitment to do Christ's will and serve His purpose. I say that again. A happy marriage, a one flesh marriage is not about you, not even about the marriage. It is one flesh spiritual commitment because one flesh is about together committing to a common spiritual purpose, common spiritual priorities, and common spiritual pursuit. You give all your strength and energy to that. This is what one flesh marriage is. This is the only design that will bring happiness. All right? Now let us... Um, finish with this slide, but the problem is this. We want to get married, but we want, to get, we want marriage on our terms, not God's term. The result, unhappy marriages, marriages that fail God's purposes. When we come back, we look at, well then, this blueprint that God gives us for roles. Let us pray. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stopped attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from